Good morning, church. Good morning. All right, this is on, right? Good. Are you happy to be here? Yes. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, just reviewing what we've been looking at. Last week, we began looking at the subject of the seven last plagues. And we saw similarities between the seven last plagues and the first ten plagues. And we saw how important it is that to study the seven last plagues, we needed to also study the first last plagues. The first plagues, I'm sorry. And we saw certain similarities, such as both of the plagues were set by God, were given by God. They're not plagues of the devil, but plagues of God. That means that God sends them directly. He sent them directly in Egypt, and he's going to send them directly in the world. Both sets of plagues also come before deliverance. That's a very important key to remember. God does not deliver before affliction. He afflicted Israel, even Israel. But yet God was with them through the ten plagues. And God will afflict his people and the world, but yet God will be with us. Through, the, the, through the, the seven last plagues. Both sets of plagues are a punishment on the wicked. And also both sets of plagues are a trial to the righteous. Are a trial to the righteous. You see, God was dealing both with the wicked and with the righteous. If God knows that you and I are going to be alive during the seven last plagues, then he is confident did God know you were going to be born in this time? Yes. yes, nothing escapes God. And so if he knows that you're going to be alive during the end of times, during the seven last plagues, then he knows and is counting on his people to pray more, to read more of his word, to consecrate more, to study more, to come to church more, to come to prayer meeting more, to fellowship more, to forgive more. Because God is in the business of polishing his people. And if there is something that needs to come out of us, God will work it out. And we saw also last week, I, 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 I kind of gave an illustration here of how the seven last plagues bring the close of probation. Bring the close of probation. I use the platform as an, as an illustration and this being a timeline. Do you re re remember that, those who were here? So those who were here, a little quiz. What did, what did the piano represent? National the National Sunday Law. Good. Revelation 13 says, we, we, we saw that earlier already, that, that this beast will cause, will make everyone to worship the beast. Will cause to everyone to receive a mark on his right hand or on their forehead. So the piano represented the National Sunday Law, the mark of the beast. And so timeline is coming here, and we said that, that the pulpit was what? Seven last the seven last plagues. When the plagues would begin, and then time would continue, and the organ represented what? The second, the second coming of Jesus. Something important. Do we know when this is going to happen? No. Do we know when this is going to happen? No. Do we know when that is going to happen? No. Why? Could, couldn't God give us, had given us a time a date prophecy when maybe at least one of these would happen? At least one of, one of these two. Could he? Of course he could have. He could have given us in scripture. Didn't he give us when judgment would begin in the heavenly sanctuary? The date and time, year 1844? You know, God could have given us. But you know why God didn't give us these dates? Because he knows us very well. And he knows that if he would have given us this date, or even that date, we'd be sitting down and just waiting. Well, I still got about five, five more years before National Sunday Law, so I'll, I'll wait to go to church. I'll wait to give my heart to God. See, that's why it's important that we do not delay. We do not play with our salvation. Because God purposely did not give us any of these days because He wants our hearts to be ready every day. Yeah. Every day. Every day we should live as it, is, as it is our last day and be right with the Lord. 
And so we saw that. Now this morning, today, we're going to look at part two of deliverance through the plagues. So let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you very much for your goodness and for your promises in your word. Be with us today as we open your word. Please remove any demonic influence in this sanctuary and help us to be filled with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Is God love? Yes. Amen. John, 1 John 4 verse 8 says, He who does not love does not know God because God is love. Is love. So if God is love, why would a loving God pour out seven last plagues? Have you ever asked yourself that or somebody asked you that? Now, is it true that all prophecies are Christ-centered? Do all prophecies point to Christ in one way? Sure. Let's take the example of the, of the 2300 day prophecy. That points to Christ as our judge in favor of his saints. The 70 week prophecy points to Jesus' ministry is all over that prophecy. Uh, Daniel chapter 2, the prophecy of the, of the statue of Nebuchadnezzar, the main the main point of that, of that dream, of that prophecy, is the stone, which is the second coming of Jesus. And Jesus in that dream was letting Daniel know and us know that he knows what's going to happen next, but yet he has not forgotten us and will come back for us. How about Daniel chapter 7? Or Revelation chapter 13? The prophecies of, of the little horn is still centered around Christ and Christ is exposing Exposing the Antichrist. And God is saying, I am the real Christ. Worship me. So can the seven last plague teach us something about Jesus? They have to be Christ-centered. Everything in scripture is Christ-centered. And if we don't see it, then we need to spend more time and reading it and asking God to help us find it. So let's, let's go ahead and turn to the first plague there in Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16. We're going to see how these are Christ-centered. In these seven last plagues, we're going to see that there are actually seven promises for us. Seven promises for God's people. Revelation chapter 16 verse 2. As you're looking there, I want to also mention that, you see, these plagues are literal plagues. They're not symbolic. They're literal plagues. When you read Revelation, they're literal plagues. When you read the great controversy, they're literal, literal plagues. So Revelation chapter 16, verse 2. So the first, talking about the plagues. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth. And a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and, whose, and those who worshipped his image. Who did the sores fall upon? Those who had the mark of the beast, right? So who didn't it fall upon? On God's people. On God's people, right? Those who did not, those who refused to, to worship the beast. You see, this first plague we see here is a physical affliction. Isn't it not? It's, it's, it's a boil. A pussy, red, boil, sore all over your body it, it is it is a physical a physical affliction and with every single plague there is a message from man but a message from God you see in the first plague man's message is take the mark of the beast and we will give you physical security we will give you a physical security you don't want to suffer pain you don't want to be persecuted when this happens when the National Sunday Law comes, they're going to be influencing you. Just come along. Let's all worship together. You don't want to be persecuted. You don't want to suffer physical afflictions. If you come and take the mark of the beast, we will give you physical security. But you see, God's message is physical security only comes from Christ. Only comes from Christ. And so, even though you may be here thinking, no, I'm still going to trust God and not worship the mark of the beast or be part of it. And when the plagues begin, who has physical security now? 
God's people. And those who thought that they had physical security and were promised physical security, they no longer do. They no longer do. I'd rather trust Jesus with my body than go, than go to a spiritual healer and get healed now but then suffer boils later. Because our bodies belong to Him. And physical security only comes from Jesus. If you, if you open there in 2 Samuel where our scripture was, 2 Samuel chapter 22. 2 Samuel chapter 22. God is reminding us that although we may not see, He is with us and will give us the physical security that we need. When everyone else is trying to figure out what to do with their sores or boils, going to their doctors and not finding a solution, and yet a group of people, a remnant, with no physical illness. 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 1 through 4, The Lord, the, then David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord had delivered him from the hand of all his enemies. And we will also say when God has delivered us from our enemies and from the hand of Saul, he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. The God of my strength in him I will trust. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my savior. You save me from violence. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from violence my enemies so there in this first plague we see that a physical affliction is going to come and they may promise physical security but our only source of physical security is in Christ Jesus is in Christ Jesus the second plague look at there Revelation 16 Revelation chapter 16 verse 3 you see there the second plague Revelation chapter 16 what verse Three. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man. And every living creature in the sea died. Can you imagine that? I don't think we, we, we really do. Just think about it. If the sea becomes as blood, and every sea creature dies in the sea. What is that going to do to, to shipping? What is that going to do to shipping oil? <laughs> That's just gross. What is that going to do to the economy? It's going to affect it greatly. You see, there will be a crisis like we cannot imagine. And we cannot imagine. Think of all the ports, all the shipping, all the global market. The whole economy might even just collapse. And, and you see, man's message is take the mark of the beast and we will give you financial security. If you don't take the mark of the beast, you can't buy or sell. But guess what? When the economy goes belly up, and people can't transport from one country to the next and the sea is blood and the animals are dying and, and ports are no longer working and ships are, don't know what to do and the oil out there is not producing what it needs to produce. God's message is all economic security is in Christ. Every single. You see, man's message is take the mark of the beast and you will, ha and you will be able to buy and sell. And if you don't, Take the mark of the beast, then you won't have a job, you won't have economic money security. But our security comes from God. Our economic security comes from God. Look at Psalms 81. Psalms 81. I just really enjoy how David puts it here and knowing and counting that his security. God, his provision comes from God. Psalms chapter 81. While man may be promising you a job, it won't do any good when the plagues begin and the market crashes. Psalm 
Psalms 81 verse 10. It says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Can you imagine God also saying those words in the last day? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Babylon, out of the mark of the beast. And then what does it say? Open your mouth, what? Wide. Wide. And I will fill it. Amen. Amen. You know, God doesn't say, oh, I will provide. Open your mouth as wide as you can because I will fill it. God will be our security. Isaiah 33, 16 says that our bread and our water will be sure. Amen. We'll be sure. We won't need to worry. Oh, how, what am I going to get to eat? What am I going to provide for my children? God will give us what we need. So, there we saw in the first plagues that the boils and the sores are a physical affliction, but our physical security is only in Jesus. And the second plague here, we see that it will affect the economy, but our economic security is only in Christ. It's only in Christ. Now Revelation chapter 16, looking at, at the third plague, Revelation chapter 16, verse 4 through 6. This is, this is the third bowl, the third plague. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the and, and I heard the angel of the, of the water saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things. For they have shed the blood of the saints and prophets. In verse 6, For they have shed the blood of the saints. Who is the they? The wicked. The wicked. Because who do they kill? The saints. It's, it's right here, right? For they have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. For it, for it is their just due. You see, the springs of water is turned to blood. And yet here, God is telling us, you have killed God's people. You have killed God's people with and now, I will give you blood to drink. I will give you blood to drink. You see, before the close of probation, which is this section right here where the plagues begin, before the close of probation, there will be some that will be martyred. There will be martyrdom. During this time right here, from when that decree is made law to this time, we don't know when this is, but we will know when we see it, when you see sores on other people and boils on the rest of the world, then you know and pray to God you don't have any on your skin. <laughs> That's why during this time, during this time, what are we going to be doing? I hope we're on our knees praying and making right with God and doing what pleases God because we love God. But before the close of probation, there will be martyrdom. After the close after the close of probation, there is no more martyrs. Satan will not kill any more of God's people. And why, why is that? You see, the reason why God allows one of his children to die is because during this time, if one of us, I'll take myself as an example, and put to jail, they execute me in jail, for not following along with the rest of the mark of the beast, God will knows that my death could cause a judge or someone to accept the gospel. God knows. Isn't that what happened with Stephen? God knew that Stephen's sacrifice and death would be a, turn, a turning point for Saul who became Paul. And God used Paul in a miraculous way. And during this time, there will be martyrs that God knows that there are people who are not fully convinced, but when He sees Christian people giving their lives to God. You know, when John Huss was burned at the stake, history says that he sang a, a hymn. 
The only way you can do that is if you have the peace of Christ in your heart. And that was a testimony to others, to others, to follow God, to follow God. You see, we are, we are not play toys for the, for, the, for the devil, but God knows that if someone does die for him, it will affect someone else to accept the gospel. And God will do whatever it takes. That's how much he loves us. Amen. That's how much he loves us. That he may put somebody to sleep who is ready. Who is ready will put him to sleep if it will win someone else. If it will win someone else. God goes to extreme measures to save as many people as possible. As many people as possible. And here's man's message is, take the mark of the beast and we will preserve your life. We will take care of you. You won't go to jail. You won't die. We'll preserve your life. But God's message is, only Christ is our source of life. Amen. Only Christ is our source of life. And if we die, as Jesus says, on the cross, Lord, into, my, into your hands I commit my life. And so looking at now at the fourth plague there in Revelation 16, verse 8 and 9. Revelation 16, verse 8. The fourth plague continues then saying, Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues. And they did not repent and give him glory. Here in this fourth plague, they were scorched from the sun. What is the main, what is the main object in this great controversy? It is the issue of what? The issue of worship. Isn't it? From the very beginning, the issue of worship. And rather than worshiping the Creator God on the day of remembering Him as Creator, they have set up a law to worship on a different day. To worship on the day of the sun. And they haven't realized that the object that they have passed as a law <coughs> has been worshipped through the ages. Through the ages. The, the Egyptians, when God delivered Israel out of Egypt, the Egyptians worshipped the sun through their sun god Ra. The Babylonians worshipped the sun god as well through Marduk. The Persians worshipped the sun god through Mithra. The Romans worshipped the sun god through Apollo. And that which has been the object of worship scorches men. Scorches men. And so here man's message is almost worship on the day of the sun. Almost, almost worship. Isn't, isn't that what this is? National Sunday Law? Almost worship on the day of the sun. And God said, you want to worship the sun? I'll give you the sun. And he gives them the heat of the sun that scorches them. But God's message is our true worship is in the sun of righteousness. In Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ. So the first plague is, is a physical Affliction that God promises that our physical security only comes from Him. The second plague, when the sea is turned to blood and, uh, and it affects the economy, God reminds us our financial, our economic security is only in Christ Jesus. Amen. When the rivers are turned to blood from the, the martyrs that may die, Jesus says, I, I will give them blood to drink. Because our life is in Christ. In the fourth plague, when everyone is worshiping the sun or the sun day, the day of the sun, God says, worship the true. His, his message is worship the true God of, creator, of creation. The one who created the heavens, the earth, and the sea, and all that is within it. Now the fifth plague, here in Revelation chapter 16, verse 10. Revelation 16 verse 10 says, Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness. And they, 
and they nagged their tongues because of the pain and they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and did not repent in their deeds notice that their sores are still happening they still got the sores here even in the fifth plague here in this fifth plague we see that God gives darkness on the seat of the beast on the seat of the beast you see because during this time when this is passed, everyone thinks it's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. Yes, let's all come in unity. Let's all come together and worship together in the same day. There, there, there is still going to be different denominations. But everyone will have the, the same commonality of worshiping on one day. On their day. And everyone will look to the beasts as a source of light. But here on this plague, what does... God do he bring darkness on the seat of the plague on the seat of the plague they look to the beast but they will only find darkness they look to the power of the beast and will not find light when the plagues come and they are scorched with boils water is turned to blood Their economic security, their, their economic security falls through. They're going to turn to guess who? Hey, didn't you say we're going to get better? Hey, didn't you, di didn't you promise if we had this, this unity, it would be better? And when they turn to the false light, God will bring darkness. Darkness. You see, man's message is our truth is the source of light. Our truth is the source of light. But God's message is only God is the source of light. Only God is the source of light. John 14 verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one come to the Father except through me. Except through me. Through these seven plagues, there are seven promises. And just, just reviewing the first plagues are boils and sores, a physical affliction. But if your hands are in the hands of God, friends, you have physical security. You do not worry of what comes upon your body. But the true believer, the true believer, when those of plagues hit, the true believer will still be praying and mercy on those that do have the seven last plagues. If you, if, you read, if you read Patriarchs and Prophets, while the plagues had attacked Egyptians, Israel was still pleading God mercy for them. While they were being scorched with frogs, with lice, with dying cattle, with darkness, with blood, God's people were over here in Goshen enjoying the blessings of God. They still felt a need and felt sorry and prayed God have mercy on them. The Christian isn't joyful. That's <laughs> what you get. Is he? No. That is not in the heart of a Christian. That's not in the heart of Jesus. And so while people may be having boils or sores, our physical security is only in Christ. When the sea turns to blood and, and shipping becomes almost impossible. And can you just imagine all the sea creatures dead? I mean, once in a while, you know, you see on, on, the, on the news where, you know, whales may wash up or dolphins may wash up. Imagine, I don't know if they're all going to wash up. I don't know what's going to happen. But all the sea creatures die on how that will affect the economy and the ports and the shipping and the oil that we also do out there in the sea. And when our economic security seems to be gone through, God says, your economic security is in me. Is in me. I will provide. Open your mouth wide because I'm going to fill it. Amen. You just cling to me. That's the promise that God gives us. When the rivers turn to blood and they cannot drink anything, God says, you have killed my martyrs, my people. You will now drink from, the blur, from their blood. God, our life is secure in Christ. Our life is secure in Christ. When the sun scorches because they when the sun scorches thinking that they have the true light 
and God gives them darkness, God promises all truth is in Christ. All truth is in Christ. Now the sixth plague. The sixth plague. Right here. Here we go. The sixth plague is the battle of Armageddon. But we're out of time. I gotta keep you, I gotta leave you with a hook somewhere. <laughs> friends, friends, you see, you see, some people look at the plagues and are, and, and are worried about the plagues, but they miss the promises of God. The promises of God will provide our physical healing, our physical, our physical needs of not going through those sores, our physical food of not worrying about buying or, or selling, because God's gonna provide our needs. God's gonna, God will continue to be the true source of our light. Even during this time or during this time, we will still be meeting every seventh day to worship God in His holy day. Amen. God will still provide. Psalms 46. I want you to open your Bible to Psalms 46. We will look at the battle of Armageddon next time. Spent an entire time on the battle of Armageddon. I would do unjustly if I wanted to cover it in five minutes. Psalms chapter 46. But we're not done yet. Psalms 46. Verse 1. Psalms. What Psalms? 46. Amen. Verse 1. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. Amen. Therefore, because of that, we will not what? Fear. We will not fear. Though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and, the, and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. That sounds like time of trouble. There is a river whose streams shall make glad the cities of God. The holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the, most, in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just as the break of dawn. You see, that's what I said. That before deliverance has got to come affliction. Dawn is right after the midnight darkness. God will help her just as the dark, just as the break of dawn, the nation raged, the kingdom were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. Verse 7, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord who has made desolation in the earth. He makes wars Cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots in the fire. Be still. How can you be still after all of that description? What God does and everything. And then God says, be still, come down and know that I am God. You know, this, this, this reminds me of when Egypt, I'm sorry, it was when Israel was there at, at the Red Sea. And they're all, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What you bring us here, Moses? And even Moses cries to God. And there in Exodus 14, 15, God says, come down. Why are you calling to me? Just tell the people to keep marching forward. Here it says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us the God of Jacob is our refuge friends in the time of trouble I do not want you to have your stomach in a knot friends or with fear I do not want you here to leave fearful but on the contrary to leave confident confident in Jesus Christ that God has given us promises through these plagues if we surrender our hearts to him and do the things that please Him. He is greater than any time of trouble, either present or in the future. And I want to 
invite you to get, take out your bulletin if you have it to read the meditation there in the back. There are two meditations. I couldn't decide which one so I put them both. There, from Great Controversy, page 633 of the first one. It says, The precious Savior will send help just when we need it. Amen. The way to heaven is consecrated by His footprints. Every thorn that wounds our feet has wounded His. Wow. Every cross that we are called to bear, He has bore before us. The Lord permits conflicts to prepare the soul for peace. The time of trouble is a fearful ordeal for God's people, but it is a time for every true believer to what? To look up, and by faith he may see the bow of promise encircling him. The Redeemer of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion, and, everla and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrows and mourning shall flee away. Yeah. Amen. There in 629, the next paragraph, just right after that. That God who cared for Elijah will not pass by one of his self-sacrificing children. What kind of children? Self-sacrificing. So what happens with me, myself, and I? What happens with the I? It's sacrificed. I am crucified with Christ. Therefore, I no longer live, Paul says. The God who cared for Elijah will not pass by one of his self-sacrificing children. He who numbers the hairs on their heads will care for them. Don't worry. God will still care for you if you have no hair. <laughs> Friends, God cares for every single one of His children. He who numbers the hairs of their head will care for them, and in time of famine they shall be satisfied. In time of famine they shall be satisfied. While the wicked are dying with hunger and pestilence. That sounds like the first two plagues. Hunger, because you can't, there's problems with the economic and pestilence with all boils. While the wicked are dying from hunger and pestilence, angels will shield the righteous and supply their wants. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Imagine during the time of trouble, angels feeding you. Imagine during the time of trouble, angels appearing to you and saying, no, 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 no. don't go that way. I'll show you a better way. Go through here. Oh, friends, it gives me, just thrills my soul. These promises, these, these are also promises. What I'm reading from Great Controversy, they are promises for us. These are promises from inspired word of God given to His remnant people. So, where was the Father when Christ was on the cross? He was right there. Could Jesus see him? No. Did Jesus know that, that, that his father was there? Did, did the father love Jesus less when he was on the cross? No. Did Jesus go through rejection? Will we go through rejection? Yeah. Did Peter deny Jesus? Yes. Will Peter deny us? I'm sorry, will people deny us? Yes. Did Judas betray him? And people will betray us. Sometimes the most difficult time is when it comes from your own family, friends. Did the disciples forsake him? We will be forsaken too. Some of us will forsake us. But don't be thinking. Don't be thinking, oh, you know, poor me. Somebody betrayed me today. Oh, poor me. Someone didn't smile at me today. 
someone doesn't want to be my friend anymore. You see, maybe Jesus, maybe Jesus in love is giving us a lesson. Is giving us a lesson. Maybe God is allowing people to disappoint you so you can learn to trust Him and not trust people. Not trust people, but trust God. I can guarantee you, no matter what church you go to, you will find something that will disappoint you. But I can guarantee you that you will find God in every church with an open heart and hand waiting to be with you. And never to let you down, never to deny you, never to betray you, never to forsake you, but to be with you. You see, on the cross, Christ went through a deep and dark time of trouble, but he trusted his Father through, although he could not see him, because he learned to trust his Father every day of his life. So when the time of trouble came, he continued to trust his Father. He continued to trust his Father. Jesus had victory because he had faith in his Father. And Jesus' last words, Into your hands I commend my spirit. Maybe some of our last words. I don't know. Maybe during this time. Lord, we may be like John. Maybe, we get, maybe we're in prison. And then we may be let out, but maybe, we're, maybe we won't get let out. Maybe we'll be lined up on an execution wall. Or like John the Baptist, with his head was put on the block to be beheaded. The only thing you can say then, friends, is, Lord, I don't know what you're doing. I trust you, and in your hands I leave my life. Jesus' words will be our words, because victory will be in our faith in Jesus Christ. Friends, how many of you want that victory? Amen. Amen. How many of you have that victory? Oh, amen. Oh, me of little faith. I didn't think too many people were going to raise their hands. It's a rebuke for me, friend. We need to make sure that you have that confidence that you have that victory today. Today. We will continue with the battle of Armageddon. And friends, right after that is Jesus' second coming. Amen. Praise the Lord. I, my, my desire and my prayer is that as we see in these plagues, we don't get too much boiled up with, oh, when is the first plague and then the second plague? And how is the sea? How is that going to work, friends? Worry about building your faith with God because all these promises that God will be our physical security, our economic security, our life is in Christ. We worship the true God. Those are the promises that we need to focus on. And there we see the promises of God in these last plagues. And God will deliver His people and give victory because we have put our faith in Jesus. Not in man, not in man's law. Man can promise whatever he wants. But my Bible says that God's promises do not fail. And God has has prepared a place for you and for me. So I'm glad that you want that victory and that you have that victory. And I encourage you to continue and never lose it. Never lose it. Never lose it. But you know... Praise the name of Jesus because in our Christian walk we may what? And fall. But when you fall on your knees, it's the best time to pray to God and get back up. And get back up. Proverbs says, the righteous man falls seven times. You know, seven is symbolic for perfection. We're perfect at falling. The righteous man falls seven times but gets up. The wicked falls once and does not get up. So praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Father in heaven, oh God, we know that hard times of trouble are going to come. And I want to thank you for laying it out before us. Nothing should catch us by surprise. 
All these things that are happening and even much more things and greater things are going to happen. And thank you for giving it to us in advance. But Lord, I pray and desire that every one of us here may hold a relationship with you and put our faith in you and our trust in you and we cling to your promises and that you will deliver us through the plagues. We will see this world collapse. We will see people failing and crying for the rocks to fall on them. They will search for death and not find it. But Lord God, help us to hold on to you every day and have victory just as Christ had victory because he put his faith in you, Father. We want to put our faith in you. Be with your church here in Cleburne, every single one of these people here, these men and women, boys and girls, may cling to you every day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.